We're starting a new series. Uh, if you're uh, new to us, uh, and maybe even new to the church, let me say this. I think I need to say this more often. If you're kind of just kind of dipping your toe in the Jesus thing, let me kind of uh, set you straight on what my hope for you as the pastor of the church that you're attending is. My hope is that you are going to cross the line of faith from not knowing Jesus uh, to knowing him from like we talked about last week at Easter, being in the Garden of Eden and guilty of sin to being in the garden that Jesus rose from and being freed from sin, all right? So that's my chief hope for you if you're kind of new to the story. And a lot of you, uh, that's not who you are and you've been around here for a while. Um, but my chief hope for all of us is that we would understand God's word. I'm gonna preach God's word to you, okay? I'm not gonna get up here and tell you my opinions. I'm not running for office ever. And... Uh, Ever, Lord, please, ever. All right, uh, but uh, but I am excited to share with you the things that God has shared with us. They're in, uh, kept in His Word, and and we just want to study it uh, often, book by book, verse by verse. And sometimes we just dive into someone's life, a person from the Scriptures, and that's what we're going to do in this series that we're starting today. We're going to look at a, a prophet uh, to Israel, uh, almost three thousand years ago, uh, a guy named Elijah. All right, Elijah's name. Kind of uh, is his calling card. Uh, it's uh, Eli or El is Elohim. Uh, it's a name for God. Uh, Jah is Jehovah, another name for God. So basically, Elijah's name is God, God, or the Lord is my God might be a better way of saying it. And that's exactly uh, what we see in his life. He is sold out in his pursuit of God. And, and he kind of comes just uh, into the story of our Bibles from out of nowhere. He just is all of a sudden in front of the, the king of Israel and pronouncing a judgment as God was often wont to do in those days uh, as a prophet. Um, but we're going to get to his story. Can I do a, a quick background? Doesn't matter, Seth. I'm going to do it. Here it comes. All right. Uh, uh, basically, the Bible is, is, is written chrono chronologically, for, and, and, and parts of the story are important to know so you can understand the story we're talking about, all right? So um, we are in an age of Israel's history where things are desperately wicked, Okay. So just real quick, Israel at this time is a, is a regency, it has a king, um, uh, and uh, if you go back to the beginning of the, the king's story, the first king of Israel is a guy named Saul, everybody remembers him? And then uh, he is replaced by a guy named, anybody know? David, so we were talking about him a little while ago. And David's son is the third king, and his name is? Solomon. All right, so those three kings all reigned for 40 years, and uh, to, you know, to varied degrees of success, not really, uh, but... Uh, but Solomon, listen, Solomon, he's the zenith of Israel's history is during the reign of Solomon the king. He asked God for wisdom early on in his life. God gave it to him. But wouldn't you know it that the wisest guy on earth was one of the dumbest guys on earth? Does anybody know this person? Who's related to this person? Anybody? They got all the brains in the world and don't know a thing. Um, that turns out to be Solomon. He, he weds himself to all kinds of wives who are from different lands. He adopts their gods and, 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 and leaves the one true God of Israel. And so God basically says, all right, I've had enough. And one of the judgments that he uh, lays out for the nation of Israel is he said, I'm going to divide this kingdom. Uh, I'm going to take what I have uh, given to the line of David away from him, and I'm going to uh, give it to someone else. So he picks this guy in uh, uh, the, uh, the court of Solomon. He's like a, a vassal or a, a member of the, uh, the kingdom. And uh, his name is, everybody ready? Jeroboam. Say Jeroboam. Yeah, name your next kid or your dog, whatever. Anyway, uh, but Jeroboam comes on the scene. God sends a, a prophet to him in 1 Kings 11 and says, Jeroboam, I'm going to give you 10 of the tribes. There's 12 tribes in Israel. I'm going to give you 10 of them. And Jeroboam's like, wow. And so Solomon hears about this, and he's like, you're right, I repent. Here's your ten tribes. Is that what Solomon does? Anybody want to guess? No, Solomon seeks to kill Jeroboam, his rival. Jeroboam uh, goes to Egypt for a time, the Bible tells us, in asylum. And when Solomon dies, this guy Jeroboam comes back, and he meets Solomon's son. I can't make this up. His name is Rehoboam. Everybody say Rehoboam. So Jeroboam versus Rehoboam. And Jeroboam tells him the prophecy, and Rehoboam's kind of soft and, and uh, doesn't really, you know, step in front of it. And Rehoboam, uh, con or, yeah, Jeroboam convinces the ten tribes of the north, see, they're hard to separate, the ten tribes of the north to go with him, and he begins reign, uh, reigning in that region of what used to be all of Israel. Uh, Solomon's uh, line, or David's line, through uh, Rehoboam is given the south. So uh, Israel becomes two countries, Israel in the north, and Judah in the south. 
Got it? That'll be on the test after the service, so make sure, okay? Uh, but we're going to follow in the story of Elijah, the story of the northern kingdom, Israel. Uh, we are six generations into the, to the line of Jeroboam. And wouldn't you know it, every one of those guys is lousy. Like just every one of these kings is just desperately wicked. And then we get to the king that Elijah meets here, and he's the worst of them all. We're in the northern kingdom. Elijah comes. It's around uh, 900 B.C., and uh, Israel has split. This is what happens. Elijah says he's a Tishbite because he's from a place called Tishbia in Gilead. I get to do my map. This is uh, the coast of Israel. This is the Mediterranean Sea over here, okay? This is Hamas and all the stuff down in Gaza that's so crazy. Uh, but uh, there's a Jordan River in Israel, basically splits the country in half. Uh, and on this side is uh, Tishba in Gilead. It's modern-day Jordan. It's no longer Israel's property. Jordan is the country there now. Uh, but this is where, isn't this great? God gives you this little you know, button thing right here for the Jordan River. It's so awesome. So this is where Elijah lives. He lives on the east side of the Jordan. He comes out of nowhere in a, from this place called uh, Tishba and Gilead. He says to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, lives, uh, whom, before, I, or before whom I stand. So he's basically saying, my God is alive. Yours is not. He's implied. Yours is not. And he's, we're going to get to his God. Ahab worships a God named Baal. We'll get to him in a second. As my God lives and as I stand before him and with him, uh, this is his word to you. There shall be neither dew nor rain all these years except by my word. He's pronounced famine over Israel. It is uh, a punishment for Ahab's ways. Why? Because Ahab is a wicked dude. It says, uh, just back up a little bit in chapter 16, it tells us in verse 33 that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, and to anger him than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So he like takes the cake. Like he had, you know, five generations uh, precede him, and they were nasty, bad, but he has taken it up to a whole other level, all right? Uh, he's not just nasty himself, he's married a nasty lady. Uh, it tells us in verse 31 that he took for his wife a, a lady named Jezebel. Anybody heard of her? Yeah. Uh, she's the daughter of a, a king named Ethbaal, uh, who's from Sidonia, which is up here in like modern day Lebanon, Okay. That's where she's from, Phoenicia, Sidonia. And uh, uh, she uh, marries uh, uh, Ahab and quickly convinces Ahab, who I, didn't, I don't think needed a whole lot of convincing, to serve Baal, this false god, and worship him. And so queen and king worship this false god, Baal, and they lead Israel right in to that uh, direction. And that's why God has to come and, and bring drought. Uh, now, don't miss this. Baal is the bull god. Sorry, USF. You're Bales. Anyway, uh, but uh, no, he's the bull god, and he, he's got a man's body and a bull's head, and uh, he was, this is so great, he was the storm god. It was believed that he was in, in charge of the, uh, the, the rains, and therefore the, 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 the provision of those who worshipped him. Everything depended on the rain, the flocks, the, uh, the herds, the, the, the plants, the, you know, the farming, and, and so he was the provider of life, and that's why they worshipped him. Uh, so it's no wonder then that God comes and he says, all right, you guys think Baal makes it rain. How about I make it stop raining? We'll see who's more powerful. It's in direct response to what he's supposed to be able to do. God does this all the time in your Old Testaments. When he tries to show up the gods of other nations in the Old Testament, like when he was uh, working through Moses in Egypt to get the children of Israel out of slavery there in Exodus. Who remembers that one? We, we talked about that. He basically sends these 10 plagues to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. And uh, all of the plagues correspond to an Egyptian deity that basically uh, Pharaoh believed to have the power. He said, no, he doesn't have power or she doesn't have power. I, the God of Israel, have all the power. Watch what I can do, right? So that's what's happening here in the story of Elijah. He goes right to the heart of Baal worship and hits him where it hurts. Now what follows is the story of Elijah. This is how it starts. Uh, the first time we meet him, he's pronouncing judgment uh, over Israel to the king of Israel. But what we're going to see is, is how God protects and provides, how he leads him through the next things. And uh, it kind of reminds me, if you look behind the scenes or, you know, in the narrative that is, you know, kind of uh, amidst the narrative, um, Elijah's kind of like going to prophet school. Like he's learning how to do this stuff. He's already passed the entry exam. He said yes to God and went and, you know, basically told the king of Israel it's not going to rain. 
Step one, you're in. Uh, but what happens next is kind of, you know, the, 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 the foundational stuff that a prophet needs to be able to serve God in, in the greater ways that Elijah's going to end up serving him, right? Who went to college? Anybody, some of us went to college. It doesn't matter if you didn't. It's getting weirder there anyway. But uh, um, when I went to college, the first year was uh, intro to everything. Did anybody go to the intro classes in college? Everything was introductory. 101 classes, right? You start there. And, and they do that because the rest of your education is supposed to build on those things, although many of you never attended those classes. Shame on you. But uh, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but this is kind of like a prophet, uh, being a prophet 101. How to be a prophet 101 is the story of Elijah here in the early days. He's learning what it's going to take to serve God in more meaningful and greater ways um, in these early days. So, uh, Let's go, to, let's go to school with Elijah, and let's learn the things that he learns as we seek to serve God as well. Um, three things uh, that were kind of the hallmarks of uh, how to be a prophet 101. The first one is this. First lesson, God will often prune even as he's providing and protecting uh, those that he loves. Uh, we can understand that uh, Elijah is needing some provision and protection in the wake of his pronouncement, right? It's not going to rain. All right, it's not going to rain. Elijah's got to eat. And so uh, God, uh, you know, justly and merciless, mercifully, huh, not mercilessly, he mercifully provides for Elijah. We're going to read about it in a second. But Elijah has also basically crossed swords with the king of Israel who worships Baal and wants everybody else to worship Baal with him. And so he has become persona non grata. His face is in every post office in Israel, most wanted. The prophet of, of God, we don't worship God anymore, we're worshiping Baal. If you see Elijah, tell Ahab. All right, so provision, protection. But what God is often doing while he provides and protects is he's pruning us, and we're gonna see that in the story of Elijah. Let's read the verses. The word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. So he's kind of going back home, he's back over here. He says, uh, you shall drink from the brook that is there in Cherith. And, and I have commanded, get this, it's the first Uber Eats, the first DoorDash. I have commanded the raven, ravens to feed you. Love it. Now, they're going to take care of you. So he went and did according to what the word of the Lord said. He went and lived by this brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. The ravens indeed brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the food. So water from the brook, sandwiches from the birds, off we go. Elijah knows to obey. He's already done it when he's uh, faced Ahab. And, and God indeed is protecting and providing for him here. This, this provision's obvious. It's the water and the food. But the protection is he's, he's off in the, in the boonies again. He, he's not findable. He's hidden in this brook Cherith or in this ravine that is Cherith. Cherith is the Hebrew word uh, uh, that comes from the, the root word karath, which basically means cut or cut from. And so like it's this ravine uh, that this brook runs through and it, it's this uh, place of hiding where Elijah can stay. But it's not simply a cut where he can hide. It's also uh, emblematic of what's going on in his life, the pruning that's taking place in the midst of the protection and provision. He's not just cut uh, off uh, from uh, the things that would hurt him. He's cut off from everything that would help him. I don't know if you could appreciate this, but this is a long time that Elijah's hanging out here. Now look what it says in James chapter five. This is a, a New Testament writer reflecting on the story that we're reading right now. James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. That's this story right here. And for how many years? Three years and six months. It did not rain on the earth. That is a long time for it not to rain, people, right? Like we get kind of fussed out around here when it doesn't rain for like a month, right? It's looking pretty dry out there, and it is. Can you imagine if it doesn't rain for three and a half years? So uh, maybe what Elijah was experiencing in the, in the first you know, month, or let's even give him six months, he's like, man, this is great. It's a famine, I've got water, I've got birds, they're bringing me sandwiches, this is awesome. But I'm guessing after a while, like the same sandwich over and over again, you know, the same tepid water from this brook, um, being separated from those that he loves and knows, just kind of being alone. Anybody ever been alone for a long time? That's one of the ways we punish uh, people, is we put them in solitary, right? 
Uh, no bueno. Not good at all. And I can imagine, it doesn't say it in our Bibles, but I can imagine like others uh, that are depicted in our Bibles, and actually Elijah will be in like three chapters, come back for that one, Elijah is the first clinically depressed person in our Bible record. Uh, but uh, uh, I can imagine Elijah is kind of like, man, I mean, I'm grateful that I'm provided for, protected, but how long is this going to go? And no, no, one, no one would blame him if he got kind of fussed out with this uh, experience. It wasn't my idea of a vacation. Why, why does God do this to us sometimes? Yeah, he's providing for us, he's protecting us, but it's not like all thumbs up. Why does he, in the midst of all that, kind of let some hard stuff sneak in, as it were, right? Why is it always something? Anybody like that in life? In my life, it's always something, okay? My, my, my general status is, you know, people ask me how I'm doing, better than I deserve. Anybody saying that? That is 100% always true. But I do have questions about the stuff that isn't as I would have it, right? Why does God do that? Why does he allow us to suffer? Well, Jesus talked about it when he was teaching his disciples in John 15. He was relating to himself, uh, you know, in a botanical sense. He says, I am the true vine, all right? Uh, and he goes on to say, and, uh, if you're a part of me, you're like the branches, right? If your faith is in me, you, you become grafted to me, the true vine, and my life is your life, and you have you know, a, a renewed spiritual existence through faith in me. It's a great picture. Read the whole thing. It's awesome. Go home and do it. But what he says here is that I'm the vine and that his father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. He's got some pruners, right? And he, he says uh, in verse 2 that uh, anybody who doesn't bear fruit, um, well, it says it right there, every branch that bears fruit, uh, every, uh, every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he, he cuts off. But every branch that bears fruit, the good branches, he still insists on pruning those branches. Why? That they may bear what? More fruit. So God cuts us so that more fruit can come from us. He allows hard things to, or even appoints, look at me, he even appoints hard things as a means of pruning off the parts of us that are of no use to us or him in preparation for what we're gonna face in the days to come. I get up early Saturday mornings and watch my, or watch my dog, I also watch him, but I walk him, and uh, I, I marvel at all the people who care more about their yard than I do. God bless you. Uh, they're out there just early morning trying to beat the heat, and, uh, and they're just digging in their yards all the time. And I see them. They're pulling out dead plants, and they're tripping back, you know, their bushes and stuff like that, all in an effort to make things look nice, certainly. Uh, but they understand, you know, green things better than I do. They understand that if I don't cut this back, the whole thing's going to die and become a mess. And God is, understands the same thing about us. Uh, he challenges us, allows us to go through hard things so that we can be better. And we can bear more fruit and receive from him what he has for us. This might help. Karate Kid, who watched Karate Kid? Anybody watch Karate Kid? If you haven't watched Karate Kid, welcome to America. It's good to have you. Uh, this should be required as part of your you know, uh, citizenship. You have to watch Karate Kid. Maybe not, but it's full of great lessons. And the chief lesson is, if you don't know the story, basically this kid Daniel moves from New Jersey to California with his mom. He goes to school and gets beat up immediately, right? And he's like, I gotta learn to defend myself. There's a neighbor somewhere in his uh, neighborhood called Mr. Miyagi. He, he's, he's known to know uh, karate, and so Daniel meets Mr. Miyagi, asks him to teach him how to defend himself. Mr. Mi Mr. Miyagi agrees. He straps that crazy looking bandana on his head. And Daniel's all ready, right? To, to learn how to do karate. And what's, what's Mr. Miyagi tell him? Who's, who's seen it? I want, yeah, I know you're doing the line, but I want you to clean all the cars in my yard. He's got a ton of cars. I, I watched the movie again just to kind of make sure I had the story right. He's got more than one car. It's a bunch of cars, right? And, he, and Mr. Miyagi says to Daniel, wash all these cars. And Daniel's like, what? And he says, yeah, make sure, say it with me, Wax on, wax off, right? Make sure you do that. Now, I, I, I didn't know this one, but he, in another scene, he, he's sanding the wood floor of his porch, and he tells Daniel, sand on, sand on. He does the same kind of thing. It's maybe in reverse. But then the last thing, Daniel's like coming back to him. After one, I've, I washed the cars. I sanded your, your patio. And, and the, he's like, can we learn karate now? And Mr. Miyagi's like, nope. 
We're going to paint my fence. Paint on, paint off. Who remembers this? It's a great, so, so Daniel's obviously a little miffed, right? I put the bandana on. I thought you were going to teach me karate. And Mr. Miyagi's like, well, I am. And Daniel's like, no, you're not. I'm just your slave. I'm just cleaning your house and your cars. This is lousy. I'm out of here. And Mr. Miyagi's like, no. And he takes, who's seen it? What did I teach you? Wax on, wax off, right? Sand on, sand off, paint on, paint off. And then in the, the culmination, uh, culminating scene, Mr. Miyagi just starts doing karate chops and kicks and Daniel's waxing on and off and sanding off and on and he's, he's painting up and down and he's blocking all of them. And Mr. Miyagi's like, see? taught you karate, and you didn't even know I was doing it, and I got my paint, or my fence painted, I got my, (laughs) but isn't that what God's doing with us? We might be feeling like a lot of wax on, wax off here. I'm spinning my wheels. I don't want to be doing this. This is hard. I don't see the effect, and then God. Who's got that hindsight that's 2020? Anybody got that hindsight that's 2020? Like, like you're in a situation or have been in a recent situation, and you're like, oh, that's why I didn't buy that back then, or God didn't let me. That's why that didn't, you know, that's why, oh, oh, that's why I went through all that stuff, because God knew this was coming. And if I didn't experience that, wax on, wax off. I wouldn't have become this. Can I do a sermon sidebar real quick? Doesn't matter, here it comes. God likes giving us just enough. Has anybody noticed this? He sends Elijah out uh, into the woods and he he doesn't send him with a Kroger truck for delivering groceries. He doesn't, it's not a trip to Costco, okay? He says, I'm gonna have a little brook there, you'll have plenty to drink, but when it comes to eating, your food's gonna arrive twice a day. It's the first intermittent fasting, okay? You're gonna get food twice a day from birds and that's how you're gonna eat. And you're gonna go to sleep that night with no cupboard, no pantry, no extras. You can't go downstairs or, uh, you know, to your kitchen and open the fridge for a midnight snack. There's no such thing. I'll see you tomorrow. You'll have water to drink and the birds will be here around noon. You ever notice that? That's how God does it. Why does God do it that way? Well, because he knows that if we have a, a way too much, it's way too easy for us not to trust him or even think we need him, right? We all become rich young rulers, which is what America's full of. Everybody knows that, right? Like we are by far, and sure, everybody's like, I don't have as much as so-and-so. You've got way more than the vast majority of the world will ever sniff, right? And you're like, well, we're blessed. We are. But in the same sense, that blessing can be a curse. Why? Because if you've got, you know, full everything and two of everything, then you don't understand need in the same way that some of our brothers and sisters in the world do, right? And this is why God, you know, teaches us to pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me what I need today. Don't back up the truck. Just give me what I need so I can learn to trust you the way I need to and honor you the way you deserve. God will often prune as he provides and protects. He'll often provide in ways that we least expect. Isn't that true? Anybody uh, had this plan in life and all of a sudden you're over here? Just didn't work out like you thought? You thought everything was coming up roses, right? And uh, those weren't roses at all. Yeah, uh, uh, I love what a, a brother of mine who I uh, unfortunately uh, had to say goodbye to as we uh, put him to rest, and he's with Jesus and doing fine, but my buddy Jay, Jay Ayers used to always say, uh, there's no straight lines. Life doesn't move in a straight line. There's lots of turns and twists that we didn't expect, and God's in them, and we need to trust him through them. Look what it says in verse seven, after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Don't skip past the short verses. Can I just remind you, every one of them is uh, important? Here's why this one is important. The brook dries up because it's a famine. There's, there's no rain. And everybody in here went to science class and were like, yeah, that's why brooks dry up. There's no rain. But don't miss the, the fact that God has been providing food for a hiding prophet with birds. Okay? Do you think he could maybe keep the brook from drying up? 
Anybody? Okay, good, me too. So the fact that the brook dries up is not science, it's sovereignty. God has allowed the brook to dry up. And it changes the next part of the story. Because if you understand that God's behind the dry brook, you understand what God's trying to do in teaching this young prophet what he needs to know. He's like, okay, we've learned our lessons here. There's more faith for us to grow in. He says in verse 8 that the word of the Lord came to him. This is what God says to Elijah here by this dry brook. He's like, arise and go to Zarephath. Everybody knows where Zarephath is, right? You've been to Zarephath, haven't you, sir? I mean, it's right there. None of us have been to Zarephath. It doesn't exist anymore. But in these days, Zarephath was way up. This is Israel. Zarephath was way up here in what is modern-day Lebanon. Uh, Back then, it was called Sidonia or Sidon. Who's from Sidon? If you weren't paying attention, that's our girl Jezebel. That's where uh, Ethbaal is king. And God says to his prophet in a season where there's no rain, you know where I want you to go? Enemy territory. Head to the worst spot on earth for you. And then he says this, I want you to go to Zarephath, to Sidon, and I want you to dwell there. And behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. Okay, uh, widows in our world uh, certainly are going through the heartache of a, of a loss, but for the most part, whether it's their families or their, you know, their earning years before them or even the government taking care of them, they don't starve in our country for the most part. Everybody agree? Uh, ladies, uh, 3,000 years ago in the Middle East, if you were a widow, you were in trouble. No government was gonna take care of you, okay? Okay. Um, if your husband's brothers in the Jewish system, if your husband's brothers wouldn't take you as their wife, which is what they were supposed to do, you would have to fend for yourself. No property, no way to get a job. Um, you would end up begging on the streets. So this is essentially what God has told Elijah, his prophet. I'm drying up the brook. You're not going to be able to stay here. I need you to go to enemy territory, and I'm going to use a homeless person to take care of you. We can all understand if Elijah's got some questions, right? He's like the guy in the story uh, who, who unfortunately falls off the cliff and he is able to grab the branch that's right underneath, like in the cartoons, there's always a branch right underneath the cliff. He grabs the branch and he's holding on to it and of course he's praying to God like he's never prayed before. Father, save me! And God in the story hears this man's cries and in the, in the, in the still of that moment or the panic of that moment, he cries out and says, I'm willing And the man says, great, what do I do? And God says, let go. And the man says, is there anybody else up there? He didn't laugh enough on that. That's good stuff right there. But it's also convicting stuff because that's exactly what Christians do today. They get over the cliff and they ask their God for help and God says, well, I need you to go to Zarephath and talk to a widow. And they're like, anybody else up there? Any other way we could tackle this? I'm listening. Uh, Invariably in your life, every once in a while, the brook's going to dry up. And God's going to send you your Zarephath to meet your widow. You want to hear about ours? My wife and I, 20 years ago, agreed to become the pastor at Bay Life Church, which has been an awesome blessing in our lives. But can I take you back 20 years? Uh, Maggie Rad was on the team that, you know, basically grilled me to no end. Uh, And somehow I accepted the job here as I prayed and asked God what to do. And all of a sudden, I've agreed to become the senior pastor, which I never wanted to be, in a church in Florida where I never wanted to live. No offense, like it now, but I did not. Florida's where you went to vacation, right? Spring break. You don't live in Florida. Who lives in Florida? And all of you are like, I've lived here all my life. Okay, relax, but I'm just telling you my story. We were uh, blessed to be in a brook. We were at a church uh, that we'd been in almost uh, 10 years. Our kids were born there. We had, we had 10-year-long friendships. We're in our you know, like mid-30s, right? Like a, a huge chunk of our life at that time had been spent with this amazing group of people at this life-giving church in this you know, uh, place that we love to live in. And God said, okay, time to go. And I'll just let you know, the first couple years here, it felt like I'd moved to Zarephath. 
and the people of Balai for my widow. I mean, if you remember, some of you don't know our story, but 20 years ago, the founding pastor of this church basically decided that he was gonna do things that would disqualify him from being our pastor. He's still loved by God, and we need to love him, but, but that's how I got the job. So I came into a, a place where there was a little bit going on. Lots of strife. I got here the first six months. We figure somewhere between you know, a quarter or a third of the people who were originally a part of us decided to go somewhere else because I wasn't like the last guy. Now God brought other people and many of you have stayed through the whole time. God bless you. But I wouldn't call it you know, like this great experience. I was doing a job I'd never done with people I didn't know. It's weird, it's hard. Uh, but here we are, 20 years later, what's up? And God has blessed us mightily, right? Yeah, God, no, okay. But get my point. Like, look back in your life. When did your brook dry up? Maybe it's drying up right now. And God's pointing you to some place you don't want to go, to the people you don't want to hang out with. Or you're like, really? And you've got a choice. Do I trust and obey or run the other way? I wonder if there's a brook in your life going dry right now. And I wonder if God's pointing you to a place like Zarephath, to a person like the widow. Can I just encourage you real quick, this this whole point, God's gonna provide. It may not be in the way that you expected, but I, I know this to be true from my own experience and I believe it to be true from everything that I've read about him in this book. God always provides. It's like the, the single mom who was raising her family in this apartment complex, she just barely had enough to scrape by and she would often pray at the uh, end of the night after she put her kids to bed. Uh, the walls were super thin, she would pray kind of loud and, and the prayers would go through the walls to her neighbor who was the staunchest, most angriest, antagonistic atheist that ever walked the earth. And finally one day, uh, he has just gotten so tired of listening to this Christian pray that he walks out of his apartment at the same time she does and, and they greet each other and he says, hey, can you just knock it off? with the whole praying to the made up whatever it is that you're praying, he's not real, he won't help, and I'm tired of listening to you. Have a nice day. Well, that month ends, and uh, once again, uh, there's been more month than check. Anybody been there before? Yeah, and, and so she's on her knees and praying, God, I don't even have money for groceries. I gotta feed these kids of mine. And so I don't know how you're gonna do it, but can you please provide me some groceries? The man's listening to this prayer, and he's like, that's it, I've had it. And he runs down to Publix, and he buys all the groceries he could think to buy, and he comes back out, and he sets them on the door stoop of this lady's apartment. He bangs on the door, and he runs around the corner so he can't be seen, and he listens as she opens the door and says these words, thank you, Jesus! Right? And then he jumps out, and he says, aha! I told you there's no God! I got you those groceries. They weren't from him, they're from me. Now will you finally let it go, lady? There is no God. And without missing a beat, the lady says, and thank you for using the devil to deliver them to me. (laughs) All right. (laughs) God often prunes even as he provides and protects. God's always gonna provide. It's gonna be in ways you don't always expect. And last thing's this, God's provision will often require some other person's faith. I want to explain this to you, but I want to watch, what happens next is he meets this widow. And what we see is Elijah in faith leaving the brook and heading to Zarephath. He does it. But for Elijah to get what God wants to give him, the widow's faith has to join Elijah's faith so that the provision of God can occur. Does everybody get that we're created for each other? And our faith, certainly, it should be a personal thing. I, you know, I understand there's an element or a side of our faith that is deeply personal, and everybody has to have their own faith journey. But, but quickly get off of that, will you please? And understand that your faith is not for you alone. It is for you to, to bind with and meld with the faiths of others so that greater things can be accomplished for God and his kingdom. Right? That's why we're hanging out in this room today. It's not just so I can yell at you like this for you know, however long it takes me to finish. It's so that you can know each other and, and do life with each other and grow and be there for each other in the situations where your faith is gonna combine with someone else's and God's gonna provide. 
So that's what we see unfold. Verse 10, it tells us that Elijah arose, and he did. He went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks, uh, which is awesome, okay? He comes to the gate of the city, and one of the first people he sees is, is this widow. And he, my, if you've ever been in that situation, anybody ever been in that situation? You're like, well, I hope this works out. And then you walk in, and you're like, thank you, Lord. And, and he's, he's looking at the widow, right? He's already found, you know, the widow, and he calls to her and he says, hey, uh, ma'am, could you bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink? And, and all, all signs are, are looking good here. All, you know, thumbs up. She's going to bring him this water. Immediately, she's willing to be a part of Elijah, the stranger's life. Uh, apparently, there was enough water to drink in Zarephath where they could share. It, it wasn't a huge ask, so he decides to up the ante. He, as she's going, verse 11, uh, to get the water, he, he called to her and he said, and by the way, if you have a biscuit, man, I could really use something to eat. It was a long walk from Jordan to Lebanon, okay? <laughs> uh, th- this is where the, the rub comes in. The challenge is in the asking for the food. Why? Because if you know the story, you know what she says. She says, as the Lord your, lo- your God lives. Now, don't miss that. Where are we again? Zarephath. Who do they worship in Zarephath? Baal. God sends Elijah to maybe the only widow in the whole town who even maybe knows that there's a God in Israel and who knows that uh, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's maybe even worth her worship. We don't know the whole story, but she knows there's a God. She knows that this guy is with him, and she claims that he lives. There's already the kernels, the beginnings of a faith friendship here. He says, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. He says, and now I'm gathering just a couple of sticks that I can go in and build a fire, and then I could take that flour and that oil and, and prepare for myself, you know, a little biscuit, a tortilla, whatever you can make with that stuff, for me and, and my son. It's the first time we're introduced to the fact that she's a mom. I've got a boy. We're going to eat this last biscuit, and then what's going to happen? We're going to lay down wherever we stay, and, and we're going to die. So I want you to picture this lady. She's gaunt, bones. Uh, She probably hasn't eaten in days. Why? Because she's a mom. Who gets the food if there is any? The kid, right? Picture the kid, also gaunt, distended belly, all right? Has had little to nothing to eat. They're at the point of starvation where once they eat this last biscuit, they're they're not even going to be able to move, and they're just going to lay there until they die. You, you can understand if she's like, hey, I'll get you water, bro. But whatever I've got to eat, that's for me and the boy. It wouldn't be enough for you anyway. There's just no use. So Elijah lays down the story that he was given from God. He says, listen, don't fear. Just go and do as I've said. First make me a little cake and bring it to me, and afterward you can make something for yourself and your son. Um, Underline that verse if you've got a paper Bible, because it's, it's one of the verses in our scriptures that reminds us that God needs to be first. Here's what the prophet of God says to this stranger widow woman. Hey, you give to God first, and God will take care of you. It's like what Jesus taught us in uh, Matthew 6, verse 33. He says, he says to this crowd, in the context, it's poor people who are worried about what they're going to eat and what they're going to wear. God says, well, man, if, 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 if my God will take care of the lilies of the field, he'll clothe you, right? And if he feeds the sparrows, he'll feed you. But what does he say? He says, all of this hinges on you seeking first the kingdom of God. You putting God first is what's required. And then God, seeing your faith, seeing you put him in that place of first, he'll take care of you. Hmm. For thus says the Lord, verse 14, the jar of flour shall not be spent. The jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Elijah's faith had led him to Ahab, to the brook Cherith, and then to this widow in Zarephath. He had done his part, but he needed this widow to have faith as well so that both of them could be provided for 
in the foreseeable future. Thankfully, the woman has faith. In verse 15, it tells us that she went and did as Elijah said. It's like, uh, remember that uh, cartoon on Saturday mornings? Morning, mornings, huh, that's funny. Uh, Saturday mornings, uh, uh, Wonder Twin Powers. You may remember Wonder Twin Powers, they've got to be a certain age. But they'd, they'd pop fists and they'd say, Wonder Twin Powers activate. That's what I thought of immediately as I saw this. Uh, the wonder of his faith uh, knocked knuckles with the wonder of her faith and God was activated in his provision of them. Yeah. Uh, and then it tells us in verse 16 that that jar of flour indeed never ran out and that jug of oil never became empty uh, and that they ate all of them for many days, verse 15 said, according to the word that Elijah spoken, uh, God had spoken to Elijah. It's just how it works, guys. Some of you have been here for a while, 10 years ago, we as a church decided, you know what, we don't want to be almost three and a half million dollars in debt anymore. Let's just knock it out. And for three years, people gave above and beyond what they normally gave, and sacrificially, we all saw a debt dwindle until it was zero. And as you go and enjoy the baptism under this beautiful lid that's out here, remember that we paid for that with cash. Why? Because we were out of debt, because all of us in our faith gave so that we could have God's more. Are you with me? That's how it works. When we send missionaries to the mission field, they're going in faith and we're giving in faith so that our faith together can spread the gospel to a part of the world that needs it desperately. When we give to you know, feed Brandon or, or, or the other ministries that are a part of us, we are combining our faiths and talents and gifts to see greater things happen as a result of God using all of us. Just how it works, people. So yeah, your faith's personal, but understand that your faith needs to combine with my faith and the faith of the people around you so that God's will can become what he desires. God's will often, uh, God will often prune as he provides and protects. You know, as you're leaving this, this morning, maybe you're, you can just pause, get in your car, and just remember this one. How has God uh, provided for us, protected us, and then pruned us in those seasons to get us ready for next things. Just run through your history and pick a few of the seasons where you're like, oh, provision, protection, and pruning for preparation. Just think them through them. They're there, and God used them. Uh, Secondly, God will provide in ways that we least expect. Is there a brook in your life that's drying up? Is God sending you to a place you don't wanna go, to some people you don't wanna hang with? Yeah. Trust him. Uh, He's got you. And he will provide in ways you don't expect. And then finally, uh, God's provision is going to often require another person's faith. We need each other. God's designed us that way. So I wonder uh, if some of you might not uh, need to ask God, am I supposed to be someone's Elijah? In faith, am I supposed to go to someone uh, who who needs some prompting in their lives uh, so that uh, together we can see God do more? Some of you might already, uh, you know, be in a situation in life where your Elijah has been talking to you over and over again. Maybe they're the friend who brought you to Easter and now they brought you back here and you're kind of like, I don't know, I'm just doing this because I'm being nice. But but here's the deal. That that Elijah in your life is trying to prompt a faith in you just like he was trying to get the widow to help him uh, feed her and her boy and himself. And and just consider, you know, who's my Elijah? Who is God using to push me and prompt me? Uh, Sometimes... uh, uh, youngers, it's your parents, your spiritual parents, whether they're physical or just, you know, your spiritual mentors. Um, be willing to listen and move in faith together. Uh, why? Because God, listen, God's real. He loves us. He's for us. And he's over all things. He's able to do what's impossible and break what's unbreakable. Uh, he's our provider. We sang that earlier, right? And we could trust him to provide. So let's do that. I'm gonna go get ready to baptize some folks. But will you close with me in prayer? As you stand, we're gonna get to sing one more song. God, thank you so much for your grace to us. Uh, Lord, lead us in these things, I pray. Thanks for being our provider. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.